basic steps to abundant health. And uh, I pray that it will be a blessing to all of you. Let's have prayer, and then I will let them come and share with you. There's going to be six of them that are going to be coming and presenting one of these basic steps at a time, and they will be introducing themselves as they come. Let's pray. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you have given us so much um, to enjoy um, our lives physically, mentally, and spiritually. We're thankful for these basic steps that can help us to have a better and more abundant life. And I pray that, um, that we will be able to understand how these principles and apply them to our lives, that we uh, may have the blessings that are in store in them. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Amelie, for those of you that don't know me. And if you can't remember that, think omelet. It helps a lot of people. <laughs> Amelie. All right, so my topic this morning is nutrition, what we eat. How many of you like to eat? So there's apparently one of my sisters. Okay, now she does. <laughs> Any of you don't like to eat? No, good. You guys need to eat. <laughs> So in this presentation, we're going to discover how what we eat impacts our health and why it's important to make the right choices regarding our diet. So let's start with how our diet impacts our health. The second most common risk factor for disease, for chronic disease specifically, is poor nutrition, according to the CDC. In fact, 90% of the top 10 causes of death in the U.S. are affected by diet. That's a lot, isn't it? So what should we be eating to avoid disease? Let's see what the Bible says. Genesis 1.29 tells us that we were created to eat fruits, seeds, nuts, etc. But after Adam sinned, God added something to the diet. Does anyone know what it was? Vegetables. In Genesis 3.18, God adds the herb of the field, or vegetables, to the diet. Now notice, it does not say, and you shall eat the cow of the field. So why didn't God include meat and animal products in the original diet? In the book Councils on Diet and Foods, Ellen White says this, the liability to take disease is increased tenfold by meat eating. Wow, so why did God allow Noah to eat meat after the flood if it's gonna increase the risk for disease? Well, there wasn't really anything else to eat, was there? Maybe some rocks, can't eat those. So, God let them eat meat, but he also put restrictions on what animals could be eaten and how the meat was to be prepared. So, the blood was to be drained and the fat removed when the animal was killed. So, this means that unless we're buying kosher meat, it's still unclean, even if it is technically a clean animal. So, let's take a look at some of the benefits of being vegetarian in relation to disease. In some studies, it has been shown that you can reduce the risk of having a heart attack by 80% with a vegetarian diet. The total mortality and risk of cardiovascular disease is decreased 40%, and the incidence of cancer is lowered 8%. Your risk of stroke is decreased 29%, and the risk of developing metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes is cut by about 50%. So this is a lot of benefits from not eating meat. What about dairy? The Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine states that milk and other dairy products are the top source of saturated fat in the American diet, contributing to heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and Alzheimer's disease. So diabetes, heart disease, and Alzheimer's were mentioned as being connected to dairy use, but there's other connections as well. Regular consumption of dairy products has been linked to prostate cancer. Men who consumed the most dairy products as teenagers had the most bone fractures as adults. So using meat and dairy products actually weakens your bones. Some studies have found that high dairy consumption increases overall mortality. And there's also a connection between dairy and breast cancer. One study found that women who consumed the most American cheddar and cream cheeses had a 53% increased risk for breast cancer. Another study found that women who consumed a quarter to a third cups of milk per day 
had a 30% increased risk of breast cancer, one cup a day increased risk to 50%, and two to three cups increased it to 80% risk. These are big percentages, and all of these things add up, don't they? So what can we eat that gives us the nutrients we need while decreasing our risk for disease? The ideal diet from God. God knows what's best for us. He didn't include animal products in the original diet because he knew it isn't good for us. So let's review the diet he gave us. A whole food, plant-based diet. Whole grains, vegetables, legumes, those are beans, peas, and lentils. Seeds, fruits, and nuts. This is the diet that God planned for our greatest health. All the nutrients we need comes from these different categories without any bad side effects like other things. So here are six simple tips for good nutrition. Number one, apply the original blueprint for diet. Number two, don't overeat. Too much of a good thing is what? A bad thing, yes. Number three, have five to six hours between meals. This is so your stomach can fully digest the food before it gets more. Number four, avoid highly processed foods and excess sugar. I don't have time to go into details, but I think most people know they're not good for you. Number five, if you eat supper, make it a light, easily digestible supper at least three hours before sleep. Your stomach needs time to prepare for bed and your sleep will not be of as good quality if your stomach is digesting food for half the night. And the last one, number six, no snacking. Snacking slows your digestion and causes fermentation of the food in your stomach. And the stomach needs rest like you. It shouldn't be working all the time. So these steps are all very simple, but the choice is ours. So what is your choice? What is my choice? Do we put into practice what we know, or do we say it doesn't really matter? Will we choose to glorify God in our diet? Now, it may seem like too much to some of us, but let's remember Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God can help us make whatever changes he wants us to make, and we don't have to do it all at once. Take it one step at a time. Leave one thing out of your diet and replace it with something better. And don't get discouraged. Here's a promise that God gives us when we obey him. If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. So if we do all to the glory of God, he will heal us. Let's remember this as we seek to apply these principles to our lives and we will live happy and healthy lives by God's grace. All right, thank y'all for coming. We'll see you at lunch. Just kidding. Um, my name is Cheyenne. If you can't remember Cheyenne, think of cayenne, cayenne pepper. It helps a lot of people. Um, so today I'm gonna be talking to you guys about exercise and why it is important. I'll give you the first reason and probably the most important one. Activity is the law of life and idleness is death. And that quote is taken from one of my favorite authors. We would do well to live by this principle, although at times we may not always be consistent with it. I know personally I'm not. However, I want to share with you some statistics that might put things into perspective. So let's talk about obesity rates in the United States. The obesity rates in America are through the roof. Most people know that. But did you know that about 36% of Americans, sorry, I'm not a Mac user, this is new for me. So 36.5% of adults in the United States are obese, and an additional 32.5% are overweight. That comes up to two-thirds of the American population, the adult population in America, that are overweight. overweight. These numbers are only projected to rise, and recently another negative factor was introduced into the equation. And anybody knows? It was COVID-19. You might be wondering what COVID-19 has to do with obesity. Well, if there was one thing that this pandemic created for a lot of people, it was stress. An article by Food Safety News states the following. One of the most common stress reactions is overeating, and particularly craving foods rich in processed carbohydrates and fats. To put it simple, junk food. Because of the stress caused by this pandemic, experts have hypothesized that the obesity crisis will only worsen. 
The article goes on to say, experts found that obesity also increases the risk for more serious complications of COVID-19. And unfortunately, these statistics are merely side effects of the culture of inactivity that's prevalent in our society today. In a culture of inactivity, more people die for want of exercise than through over fatigue. Very many more rust out than wear out. And that's taken from a book entitled Councils on Health. Essentially, people are dying unnecessarily, and it does not have to be that way. The good news is that the lifestyle of inactivity is both self-diagnosable and self-treatable. And that's where exercise comes in. Exercise is a key component in maintaining good health. So let's look at what it can do for us. First of all, exercise is one of the best ways to prevent sickness. It cleanses the lungs of bacteria that are responsible for colds, flus, and other kinds of respiratory illnesses. It also boosts the immune system by speeding up the response of white blood cells that can help fight illness in the body. And third, exercise raises the body temperature, which helps to prevent bacteria from growing so the body can better fight infection. Exercise is amazing to help physical illness, sickness, but it's also wonderful for sickness of the mind. So let's talk about stress. I'm sure most of us are familiar with it. Exercise is amazing for stress because it's able to relieve the tension in the muscles that cause us to feel more anxious. Simple stretches or even going for a walk really help me to feel a bit more relaxed when I'm stressed out. Exercise also changes the chemistry of your brain. By getting your heart rate up, you're increasing your body's levels of serotonin, which is the hormone responsible for stabilizing the mood and happiness. And third, exercise shifts your focus, and it takes your mind off of things. So the next time you feel stressed out or anxious, try going for a walk or ride your bike or do whatever kind of exercise you like, but get active. Then see if you don't feel a difference. I can guarantee that you will. And the third point I want to talk about is longevity. Exercise is wonderful for increasing longevity. Some believe that exercise can slow down or reverse the effects of aging. However, upon further research, I found that this is only true in part, and I discovered something even better. Turns out, old age is not a disease. <laughs> um, extra, oh, sorry. The greater health of older exercisers compared to sedentary counterparts can lead people to believe that physical activity can reverse or slow down the aging process. The reality is that these older people are exactly as they should be. We often confuse the effects of inactivity with the aging process itself and believe that certain diseases are purely the result of getting older. Actually, our modern sedentary lifestyles have simply speeded up our underlying age-related decline. And this is taken from an article by BBC News, and it was written by two professors at King's College London. Norman Lazarus, one of the authors, was actually noted in this piece to be a master cyclist in his 80s. I think he certainly knows what he's talking about. So we've discovered that exercise is important for everyone. However, a common problem that most people face with exercise is that they simply don't have time. Well, of the 24 hours in the day, you only need half an hour to jumpstart your lifestyle to be healthier. What's great about half an hour is that it can be broken down. Half an hour of time looks a lot like two 15-minute intervals. But if you look at it from this angle, it looks a lot like three 10-minute intervals. Now the question becomes, where can I fit this into my busy schedule? Well, anywhere you like, but I'll let you in on a secret. You should exercise in the morning before your brain figures out what you're doing. Trust me, it helps. Half an hour early in the morning, though, hands down, it's the best time to get your daily workout in. It might require an extra sacrifice of a little more sleep, but it's so worth it. You don't believe me yet? Well, here's a quote to back it up. Morning exercise and walking in the free, invigorating air of heaven or cultivating flowers, small fruits, and vegetables is necessary to a healthful circulation of the blood. This, article is taken, this quote is taken from an article in the Review and Herald. So exercise in the morning is crucial to good circulation, which is crucial for good health. So the morning is the best time to exercise. But has anybody figured out what the best kind of exercise is? I'll give you a hint. I just gave the answer away in this quote. Walking, you got it. Walking is the best kind of exercise for you. There is no exercise that will prove so beneficial to every part of the body as walking. That's taken from the health reformer. It, al it almost sounds too good to be true, right? Well, let's look at some of the benefits of walking. Did you know that walking has been proven to improve and strengthen muscle tone? Probably. But did you know that because it improves and strengthens muscle tone, it also has the ability to increase your endurance. And it can make the performance of everyday tasks just a little bit easier for both your mind and your body. And the last benefit of exercise is that 
a study done in 2019 by the Journal of the American Medical Association found that daily walking lowers the risk of mortality, death from all causes. So, in conclusion, I want to encourage you all with a verse. For those who think it's too late to start and for those who think they don't need to start, think about this. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And that's taken from Isaiah 40, 30 through 31. This promise is for each and every one of us, for every area of our lives. It's only by God's grace that we're sustained day by day. And it's by his grace that we can overcome and improve in every area by the simple things like exercise that he's given us to govern the law of our lives. So, whenever you find the opportunity, take a little walk. If you're feeling stressed, take a few laps outside to ease your mind. If you feel yourself getting sick, bundle up and head out for a short walk. It's such a small task that we can all integrate into our lives, but this task can make all the difference. Thank you. Thank you, Cheyenne. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Okay. So how many of you have attended a water presentation before? Mm, okay, good. Good for you. Well, today let's talk about water, and let's see if we can learn something new that you didn't know before. So let's start with the benefits. It prevents heart disease. Now, of those that had attended a water presentation before, how many knew this? Oh, wow, okay, so we're learning something new today. Okay, according to the um, Adventist Health Study conducted by the Loma Linda University following 34,000 Californians over 15 years, they found out that both men and women who drank five glasses of water per day had um, a re reduced risk of heart disease by 50%, so that's half, and just by drinking water. Also, another study found that women who drink more than five glasses of water a day have a 45% reduced risk of colon cancer compared with those who drink two or fewer cups of water per day. And in England, research has concluded that women who stay adequately hydrated reduce their risk of breast cancer by 79%. That's big numbers, right? But what could happen if we don't drink enough water? Well, then you might become something like this. And yeah, you're laughing right now. But the truth is that 75% of Americans are in that condition. They're chronically dehydrated. So, and these results are according to a survey that um, they did on 3,000 Americans or more. And they found that even though they were drinking eight cups of hydrating beverages per day, that was offset by a high diet in sodium or caffeinated beverages or drinking too much alcohol. So, uh, if 75% of Americans in the survey were dehydrated, that means that maybe 75% of those here are dehydrated too. So what do we do about it? So um, if you don't believe me, let's look at some of the symptoms and see if you have any. Thirst, dry or sticky mouth, not urinating much, or if the urine is of a dark yellow color, dry, cool skin, headaches, or even muscle cramps. And if you ever experienced any of these symptoms, maybe you were dehydrated. In fact, I'm having a dry mouth right now, so maybe I'm dehydrated. Okay, so what do we do about it? First, let's try to figure out how much water we need. So this is the formula. Weight times two-thirds. So in practical, let's say a person weighs 150 pounds. That's 150 times two-thirds equals 100.5. And that 100.5 means 105.5 ounces of water, which equals 12.5 cups of water. So that's how you calculate how much water you need to drink. Now that we know how much water we should be drinking, hopefully you can calculate it later. Um, let's look at some tips for you to drink more water. So don't wait until you feel thirsty. By the time you're thirsty, your body is already dehydrated, so it's too late. Keep drinking water before you get thirsty. 
And also, keep your water drinking and meals separate. When you drink water just before a meal, during a meal, or right after, then it disrupts your digestion and your body cannot absorb the nutrients as it should. So keep your water separate, okay? Also, avoid caffeinated beverages. Why? Caffeine has a diuretic effect, which means it increases the amount of salt and water released via the urine. In extreme cases, that can lead to dehydration also. And these are some samples of what things we might be used to that have caffeine. So we have soda drinks, we have coffee, of course, caffeinated teas, and even energy drinks. They all contain caffeine. Well, trying to drink more water every day can seem repetitive or sometimes even torturous. For me, it is. But with some simple tricks, that can change. It doesn't need to have t um, to be so difficult. Here, I'll share with you some tips that help me. For example, carry a reusable water bottle in your favorite color, your favorite shape, and you'll be using it a lot more. Or you can set a daily goal, and that can help you drink more water. You can set your goals hourly, as you can see in that picture. That water bottle has like hourly goals and stuff like that. I found it is really interesting. Or you can set like a goal before each meal, something like that. And if, and if you've set a goal, setting reminders would be a good next step. So you can set alarm clocks or in your smartwatch, your smartphone, to remind you every 30 minutes, drink a glass of water, something like that. You can add a little bit of excitement and flavor by steeping fresh fruit or herbs into your water. I like combinations like cucumber, mint, or lemon, basil, something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, hopefully by now, we are starting to realize that, oh, I skipped something, sorry. And if the weather is a little too cold, a cup of tea will trick your brain in thinking that water doesn't taste as boring as it used to think. Just make sure the tea doesn't have caffeine. caffeine. So hopefully by now, we are starting to realize that we do need water, and also that water is not so hard to drink as we thought it was. But I still wish there was a water that I could drink once and I will never feel thirsty again but maybe there is such water. Well, John, an author in the Bible, talks about this miraculous water that if you drink it, you will never be thirsty again. So let's read together what this is. Can you guys read with me, please? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. My prayer for you today is that you can find that water and of course keep drinking your actual water too. Thank you, Nasaya. So good morning again. <laughs> My name is Hadassah and today I'll be talking to you about sunlight. So how many of you love going to the beach? Right, yes, okay. So what are some of your favorite parts about the beach? We have the sand, the water, swimming. My favorite part about the beach is the sun. So some people intentionally get sunburned and they look like this. And that's not a good thing, sorry. That's not a good thing, right? So my talk today is not about why you should get suntan as bad as those people, but why you should go out into the sun, but just a little bit less than they did. So a fun fact that I learned about the sun is that the sun is all the colors mixed together which appears white to our eyes. What? Sunlight. Wow. How many of you open the curtains in your home to allow the sun in? Okay, that's a good amount of people. What happens when you don't receive enough sunlight? Have you ever noticed when you go into the sun, your mood changes? We are going to talk about these and find out why the sun can affect these things. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, it says, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So let's talk more about the importance of this light. So what is some of the importance of sunlight? It is good for our vitamin D levels. More than 40% of adults 
of American adults have vitamin D deficiency. That is equal to about one billion people worldwide deficient of vitamin D. And why? Because they probably don't know the best time to go out in the sun. So when is the best time to go out in the sun? We should be going into the sun before 10 a.m. and after 3 p.m. Why? Because at noon, the sun is at its highest point and its UVB rays are most intense. That means you need less time in the sun to produce vitamin D. You can do this by taking a short 30 to 40 minute walk, going outside to garden or sunbathing, small activities like that. So a lot of people use sunscreen, but I found out that sunscreen with an SPF 30 or higher can decrease your vitamin D levels by 90 to 95, 95 to 98%, which, yeah, that's not a good thing because then your body can't produce cholesterol and do everything that it needs to do when you're exposed to the sun. Another importance of sunlight is good for your bones, your blood cells, and your immune system. By it being good for your bones and your blood cells, it allows you to absorb calcium and use other minerals. A study done by a naturopathic doctor says, bone health is greatly dependent on quality light. We make vitamin D through our skin when exposed to optimum levels of sunlight. Vitamin D is a key to proper quantity and balance of calcium and magnesium in the body, as well as a healthy balance of hormones. A growing body of research demonstrates that by increasing one's exposure to full spectrum light, it is possible to optimize hormone levels in the body. Such balance is key to avoiding osteoporosis, fractures, as well as minimizing tooth decay, which is shown in the picture here. So, what are some of the benefits of sunlight? It can boost your immune system. So let's say no to disease and go out in the sun. Amen? It can prevent type 1 diabetes. So I found a study by Northwestern Medicine that says, based on what we know so far about COVID-19, people with autoimmune disorders and other health concerns have been more likely to severe complications after contracting the virus than the general population. And type 1 diabetes, as we know, is an autoimmune disorder. So if you don't get out into the sun, you can't be able to prevent it. Also, it can reduce depression. I can give a short testimony about this. So one day, I'm home and I'm sad and I don't want to do anything like my mom sees that I'm not happy. And she tells me, oh, take your little brother outside. And I'm like, I don't want to go outside. But you know, it's mommy, you got to say yes to go outside. <laughs> so I go outside and take him and I come back and I'm actually happy and calm and everything's just gone away. And my mom's like, so you feel better now, right? And I'm like, trying to shy away, like, no, you were right, but I don't want to tell you you were right. So <laughs> more than sorry, she was right. <laughs> But yeah, it reduces your depression, which you probably would have never thought about. So you see the beautiful, <laughs> nice sunset. So how many of you in this room know someone who has died of cancer? Do you personally think that can the sun has something to do with preventing cancer? In fact, I read another article that said an unhealthy diet is more likely to cause skin cancer than sun exposure. So let's see what type of cancers are prevented. So the first one is there are eight gastrointestinal cancers that are prevented. Three urogenital, three female sites, so uh, cervical and all those other types of breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and two types of lymphomas. A study was done in Sweden where 3,740 patients with infectious lymphomas and leukemia were matched with 3,187 similar people without lymphomas. The results of the study shows that those who had done the most sunbathing and traveled to the most sunny, sunny locations had up to 40% non-Hodgkin's lymphomas lowered. Similar findings were found with other types of lymphomas. So when you go out into the sun, you're reducing your risk of contracting any types of diseases. A study from, no, not a study, sorry. <laughs> a quote from one of our favorite art authors in My Life Today says, there's a whole topic just about going out in the sun. And it says, when God hath made our world and darkness was upon the face of the deep, he said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. So shall we close our houses and exclude them from the light which God has pronounced good? And the inspiring quote that I found while I was going through this whole presentation was, God's grace is not the light at the end of the tunnel. It is the light that guides us through it. So I hope that as we see how nice and beautiful it is, I want to see all you guys outside walking and getting your vitamin D in. And uh, yeah, our next topic. Good morning. Thank you, Hadassah. <laughs> yeah, it truly felt really nice as I went for the break outside. 
Appreciate the fresh air, the sunlight. <laughs> yes, so my name is Daniel. I am originally from Venezuela. And I'm very excited to share with you all the things I've learned these past three months about two very health principles that have made a big difference in my life. The first one is temperance. So what comes to your mind when you hear the word temperance? Usually to avoid alcohol, the temperance movement, to avoid drugs, but there's more to it. We all know this, that it says that uh, temperance is abstaining from all that is bad and moderation in all that is good. It sounds so easy, but it really is a very hard thing to do. <laughs> um, we may know what is bad for us and what is good for us, but we still don't do it. And we still ignore what is good. So this is where self-control comes into our lives and why we cannot live without self-control and temperance. And one of the most famous studies was done to confirm it, to back it up. And I'm sure all of you have heard about it. It is the marshmallow study. And it was done by Walter Mitchell in the 1970s to about 50, three to five year old children. And it was about, they would put it in a room, the children in one room, um, one at a time and put a marshmallow in front of them. They did some variations, but the main principle was that if they waited, the person that had them put the marshmallow there left and told them, in 15 minutes, I will be back. And if you don't eat the marshmallow, then when I come back, I'll give you another one. So you'll have two. And guess what happened? <laughs> Almost all the children went and ate the marshmallow. And a few of them uh, waited for the second one. And this doesn't really, this is not really the main purpose of the study, but to show the self-control. And the most important thing was what happened afterward with the results. They started following up with the kids that actually waited and see if there was a difference between these kids and the other kids that had ate the marshmallow right away and now waited. And they found that they were more cognitively and socially competent. They had uh, achieved higher scores in tests and also coped better with stress and anxiety and other problems like that. And it makes sense. For example, it, when the kid went back home after school, he had the choice to instant gratification, watch TV, and uh, not do his homework and study. But the kid would rather reject, deny this self-gratification, self-indulgence right away, and wait for the great reward to study, to do his homework, to learn how to play the piano, to learn how to cook, those other more productive things. And his life not just improves and gets better. But what about uh, on other things like, for example, and he sees snacks, and instead of spending his money, he saves and saves and saves. And when he's 16, 17, he has enough to buy a car. and. So what really showed, what this really shows us is that self-control is something very important in our lives, and it makes sense, right? All of this, of course, leads to a more uh, successful life, not only in our areas of our goals, but also to our health, in our health. So it includes to our health, to all the things that my friend Shayan was talking about, Emily, Nasaya, Harasa, it applies to everything. For example, temperance in eating. We know that we have to avoid the foods that are not good for us, but what about the things that are good for us? Should we just gorge on them and eat as much as we can and overeat? No, no, because I've experienced it. It may, be, it may, be, it may feel good at the time, oh, to enjoy this tasty food, but that's the, self, that's the instant gratification, and you're not thinking of the effects that it has on your body. So that's where self-control and temperance go hand in hand. Temperance in eating is very important. Also temperance in exercise. You can choose to be conformed to being, you know, it's, it takes effort to go outside, to exercise, to run, to sweat. I can just stay in my room. I can read the Bible in my room, but in activity. But the greater reward is to go, to go outside, save money on the, for example, we saw obesity as one of the causes of inactivity and all the med heart disease, all these things. You could be saving the great reward, your health, your connection with God. And all these are the risk 
of self-ratification and staying in your room, but you can also overdo something good. You can over-exercise. Um, kind of like yesterday, I was <laughs> doing a little bit too much exercise, and today I'm feeling a little bit <laughs> sore. And another one that is more personal to, I'm sure, most of us is sleep. Sleep is very important for our health, and we often either deprive ourselves of sleep, in many cases, oversleep as well when we are in vacations, and this really affects us in our health. Mm -hmm. um, I know for experience, I, I chose in the past the instant gratification of staying uh, late with my friends, uh, having fun and all of this, but really the next, it wasn't worth it. The greater reward of being active the next day, ready for the day, ready to do my school, take classes, take notes, I didn't feel like doing anything because of being late at night, and I regret all of those decisions, but now God has led me to, to really understand this and I really appreciate the gift of sleep that he has given us and do it in moderation. So this is all very important, and this, cool, this quote next is so exciting. You got you to gotta read it, you got to read it. It says, the observance of temperance and regularity in all things has a wonderful power. Okay, what is this power that it has? He says, it will do more than circumstances or natural endowments. So it will do more than sunshine or more than fresh air. It will do more than circumstances, things that you do. In what? In promoting the sweetness and serenity of disposition, which counts so much in smoothing life's pathway. Sweetness and serenity to do whatever God wants you to do, to smooth the, li the path of life that is so hard sometimes. Self-control, temperance can smooth your pathway of life. And at the same time, after temperance, you will acquire self-control. And what is self-control? One of the most valuable of equipments for grappling or ceasing successfully with the stern duties and realities that, uh, that await some human beings, not every human being, we all have difficulties that come our way, but if we have this uh, valuable equipment of self-control, we'll be able to seize all of these duties. And we have the greatest example of, of all. And he told us, what did he told us? If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Let him deny his desire to overeat. Let him deny all of these things that will hurt him and take up his cross and follow me. He didn't say, go do whatever you want, follow the world, and then you can come follow me, because everybody will follow him, right? Uh, but he wants us, he knows what's best for us, and we can go more into depth, we don't have enough time, but we have something else to finish off, and he says, let us follow the Savior in his simplicity and self-denial. He's our example. Let us lift up the man of Calvary by word, and by holy behavior. And to all who lift it and bear it after Christ, the cross is a pledge of the crown of immortality that they will receive. I was talking about the great reward, and we see that through self-denial, through temperance, the great reward is a crown in heaven. Yes, and I also will be talking about fresh air, talking about heaven. <laughs> so yeah, I have to next to each other. So yeah, speaking about heaven, the next health principle I'll be sharing is fresh air, which is also very important. And oof, I've started to appreciate air so much more now. Oh, it's so wonderful. Yeah, and I'm also very excited to share with you uh, why it's essential. It's not that it's something good for you, no. It's essential for life. Why? It says here that the U.S. National Library of Medicine the permanent brain damage begins after only four minutes without oxygen, and death can occur as soon as four to six minutes later. So no oxygen will lead you to death. So it is important in your life. But even though we can't live without air, is it possible that many times we are depriving ourselves of oxygen? Not to the point of death, but like depriving ourselves of oxygen. Hmm. It says, oxygen plays a critical role in respiration, the cellular respiration, the energy producing chemistry that drives the metabolisms of most living things. So oxygen, you can study more later, 
it's part of the cellular respiration where the body transforms uh, glucose into ATP, the energy that can be used for all its functions. So it is needed through all our body, it's needed to breathe, uh, oxygen is needed you know, for our muscles to, to work, and to better understand how we can deprive ourselves of this oxygen, we first need to understand two principles. The first one is ventilation. So to illustrate it, basically, uh, if you had to choose to drink water from there or from here, where would you drink, where would you drink your water? From this one. No, not from this one. Why from this one? What does that mean? It's flowing, right? So when it's flowing, it's not staying stagnant, it is clean, right? So same with the air we breathe. If the air is ventilating, then the air is staying clean, and we're breathing clean air. We don't want to be drinking dirty water that we grab from a dirty lake. Same with the air. We don't want to be breathing <laughs> a really dirty air. Why? But why does it get dirty when it's stagnant? So we, same, we see when it's ventilating, it's staying clean. But how does it get dirty? Because we are constantly breathing out carbon dioxide. <laughs> and so we're constantly breathing out other uh, pollutants in through our lungs. Okay. So when the air starts to accumulate all this carbon dioxide, it starts to lack oxygen. It starts to lack the oxygen. So we're depriving ourselves, our brain, we'll, we'll get more into it. So when there's no ventilation, there's poor air quality. So many things happen, the blood becomes impure, it moves slow through the body, you know, the heart pressure we were talking about this morning, the heart has to, ha has to push harder, and the body organs cannot function as they could. The brain, cannot, the brain is the organ that needs the more air, and when it's starting to lack air, you start feeling drowsy, tired, fatigue. You cannot, for example, if you're working and you need like 100% concentration and your office is, there's no air circulation, then you cannot pr function properly. And it would, only, it would also lead to impaired health. Brain clouded, become confused, also the body is weakened. So what is something that we can do to just avoid this? You know, have clean air, fresh air. Brings life to the whole body, it relieves stress, and also increases our concentration. So we can get it outside in nature. We can also get it at our homes. Some practical tips to get it at your home is to have some plants, right? The plants will transform the carbon dioxide that you're breathing out, will transform into oxygen, and you can breathe this oxygen. Also, you can, in cold weathers, in, co in hot weathers, you can open your window, let the fresh air come. But in really cold weathers, you can do something that we were doing earlier. You can crack your window just a little bit, so you can get some fresh air and the circulation can come. And as I was saying earlier, go take a walk with your friends <laughs> or by yourself, take a walk and breathe in the fresh pure of heaven. So to summarize everything, circulation of, or ventilation of air or just going outside, in basic, in general, oxygen. Oxygen in your life, uh, or pure air, will lead to pure blood and just a healthy body, and this will lead to pure thoughts, better, better understanding, better way of looking at life, happier life, and yes, health and happiness. And to finish off, we have this quote here that says, that many are suffering from disease because they refuse to receive into their rooms at night the pure night air. Many of us, um, or we know many people that are suffering from disease and this may be one of the causes. And also the free pure air of heaven, it's one of the richest blessings that we can enjoy. And let's not deny this gift that, have, that Jesus wants to give us, this pure air of heaven. So at the end of the day, it is our choice. We see that, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? We are bought with a price. The Holy Spirit wants to live in you, and if you're not thinking properly because of lack of oxygen, then how can the Holy Spirit talk to your conscience? How he can dwell in you? And we see in Romans 12, 1, that our bodies, our intellect, it is the service that we rent to God. It is our reasonable service, a living sacrifice, 
not a cloudy, drowsy, fatigued sacrifice, but wholly acceptable unto God. And that is a reasonable service. So open your windows and let the fresh air of heaven come into your life. <laughs> Amen. Good morning, everyone, again. So my name is Anisha, and today we will be talking about rest. So do we actually get proper sleep? Why do we need more rest? Well, we'll be answering these questions as we go along today. Do we get enough sleep? First and foremost, uh, according to the CDC, one in three adults do not get enough sleep. Sure, some of us may get maybe four to five hours on average, but is that really enough? Among sleepy drivers, their reaction time, their awareness, their memory and ability to communicate actually goes down 20 to 50% when they are sleep deprived. So that's one third of our population that is sleep deprived and of those, the drivers are working at a 50% capacity. Every aspect of who you are as a human, every capability is degraded and impaired when you lose sleep. Even when I'm fully rested, I make plenty mistakes. <laughs> so imagine if my brain is working at a 50% capacity. A Johns Hop Hopkins sleep researcher, Dr. Finan stated, not getting enough sleep due to insomnia, obstructive sleep apnea, or simply because you're keeping late hours can affect your mood, memory, and health in far reaching and surprising ways. Even if we're doing everything right, such as eating healthy and exercising, drinking water, we're still not being balanced in our lifestyle decisions. All of the laws of health go hand in hand. And the same researcher from Johns Hopkins reported the dangers of sleep deprivation. There are 6,000 fatal car crashes annually due to uh, sleep deprivation, as well as a three times greater risk of developing type 2 diabetes later on in life when we neglect our sleep. There is also a 33% increase of developing dementia later on in life, as well as a 50% higher risk of developing obesity if we get less than five hours nightly. And that is because when we are sleeping, our sleep cycle regulates our hormones that make us feel hungry and make us feel full. And so when we're not getting that sleep, we actually disrupt that cycle, disrupt those hormone levels, and we start to snack, and that leads to obesity. So why do we need rest? Well, for one, it improves our mood. It improves our memory and also reduces the risk of diseases as a result, will rejuvenate us for the next day. So sleep will affect our mood for the next day. A noted sleep therapist said, all the information we're taking in during the day gets reorganized during that phase of sleep before midnight. And it's very important from bringing adrenaline levels down if you're under a lot of stress. If you want to make sure you get that, so you want to make sure you get that phase before midnight. So when we get quality sleep, we won, bring our adrenaline levels down, so that will reduce our stress, right? And that will inherently improve our mood. So there are many studies on the correlation between sleeping and the increased um, long-term memory that you get from sleeping. Um, according to Dr. Walker, a sleep therapist from Berkeley, said sleeping, uh, sleep after learning is essential to help save and cement that new information into the architecture of the brain, meaning that you're less likely to forget it. And how does sleeping reduce the risk of diseases? Well, sleep helps restore the brain by flushing out toxins and dangerous proteins. These findings have significant implications for, the treat for treating diseases such as Alzheimer's, also known as type 3 diabetes. So in addition, our blood pressure actually um, becomes lower when we're sleeping. So it actually gives our heart and our vascular system a break and it gets rest as we sleep at night. And that reduces the stress in our system and the risk of diseases such as heart disease. And ultimately, when we have 
uh, better mood, better memory, and less risk of diseases, we are truly rejuvenated for the next day and energized and more clarity of mind. So how can we get better rest? Well, we can have balanced quality and better timed sleep. What does it mean to be balanced when resting? Well, we are to rest daily as well as once a week. Mark 2.27 says, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the, for the Sabbath. Sabbath was made for you and for me. God ordained a day just for us to rejuvenate and rest in him. We have a day to take off from work, to unplug from the stresses of life, and to simply meditate on God. Isn't that beautiful? We are also called to rest at the right time to maintain our daily regularity. As uh, Dr. Mark said earlier, <laughs> early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. This is false because it will not make you wealthy in a monetary way, but it will make you healthy. And health is truly our wealth. It is the real currency that we are talking about here. And how can we get better rest with our quality? Well, as we talked about this morning, one hour of sleep before midnight is worth two after it. So the hours of sleep that we get before 12 are actually the most powerful phase we can get. I don't know about you, but I'm an overthinker. <laughs> so right when I go to bed is when my brain decides to run through the day and run through the things I probably did wrong or said or mis misspoke. And <laughs> it actually takes some time to fall asleep. Often your mind may be clouded because of pain. Then do not try to think. You know that Jesus loves you. He understands your weakness. You may do his will by simply resting in his arms. Although we have many factors and conditions that we daily struggle with, we can be in God's will by simply taking rest in him. Isn't that wonderful? So what can we take home from this? Well, we can plan to be more intentional. We can avoid those late hours, uh, unplug daily as well as once a week. Avoid pushing those late nights, maybe um, turn our phones off, turn the TV or the computer off, try not to be around electronics, so we can really guard the hours of our sleep. We can also avoid day sleeping so that we can get those quality hours during the night before midnight, right? Get those seven to nine hours, hopefully, of sleep. We can also get more hours before midnight. So we can even try by making small goals at a time and start by going to bed maybe 30 minutes before our usual time. We can start by making small changes. God wants to lead us step by step to better rest in him. And maybe we can look like this baby right here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Anisha. Well, good morning again. Um, hmm. So by now, after listening to the beautiful presentations my friends just shared with us, Maybe we might have to come to realize, we might have come to realize that we need help to improve our health and live in harmony with the New START principles. Perhaps we've been trying to improve our lifestyle, but we realize that our efforts, maybe they're not enough. So maybe we need to start realizing that, that the power to change needs to come from something without rather than within. For some people, after listening to these presentations, the changes that need to be made are only small ones, but for others, the changes may seem really big, insurmountable. Regardless of the changes that need to be made, achieving good health and maintaining it may be best accomplished not by trying to make the changes, but by trusting that the changes can be made. Lasting change can only come when we realize how ineffective our own efforts are and that we need help. So, where can we find our help from? If we can't trust ourselves, who are we to trust? Is there anything left? Well, some addiction recovery groups say to put your trust in a higher power. Here at New Start, we believe the only higher power that is worthy of our complete trust is God, the creator of the universe, our forever friend. Here's a quote from my favorite author. She says, prayer is, is essential in order to receive strength 
to contend with powers of darkness and to do the work allotted us. Our own strength is weakness, but that which God gives is mighty and will make everyone who obtains it more than conquerors. Yes, this is true and it's even backed by science. Studies have shown that prayer and meditation in God's word have the ability to bolster your immune system, meaning fewer days in bed, laying up sick, and more days living out your life. And also, it can keep your blood pressure under control. In a study of more than 5,000 Americans, uh, it showed that religion and spirituality may help keep your blood pressure under control. Mm -hmm. And still another research found that men and women who attended church weekly had the lowest mortality rates. So those who are religiously involved live in an average of seven years longer than those who weren't. And that gap of seven years is as great as non-smokers and smokers. And what's the difference? They were trusting God and they were um, involved in religious services and activities. Also, the National Health Interview Survey showed that families that worshipped every other week or more were less likely to have been told that their child had a learning disability. So here you can see in the chart the blue, the blue column, the blue bar, that, was, that represents families that worship every week, and the red one, families that don't worship with their children. And you see that how families that don't worship, they have um, higher rates of childs with learning disabilities. Also, even the Journal of Public Health quoted something on this. It says, a growing body of empirical evidence suggests that regi religious involvement has salutary effects on health and mortality. Well, all this that uh, we just saw, it has, before the science had discovered these things, the Bible had already mentioned it. It said, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. It shall be health unto thy navel and marrow to thy bones. The faith factor is a powerful part of a healthy life. Maybe this explains why Jesus said to those he healed, your faith has made thee whole. Consider how people believe in doctors and the prescriptions and the drugs they, they, they prescribe. Now just think how much more it would be better to put our trust in God. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Beyond the physical benefits of trusting God in that which we can impart, let's see. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. Okay, so the Bible doesn't only help us spiritually, but also physically, right? So today, maybe we have been inspired to make some changes, to improve our lifestyle, to be healthier. That's excellent, that's great. Perhaps some are thinking to make some changes, like little changes, like open the windows of your house, or maybe the changes seem like really big changes and you're overwhelmed. Well, regardless of what changes you need to be made, if you're, even if they're big or small, achieving the goals towards a new start may be best accomplished not by trying to do, but, but trusting that they can be done. And we learn today, whom are we to trust in? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Fear thou not for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. So that's what we're learning today, and I encourage you that you make those changes, and through God, everything is possible.